Hello, Houston. We're going to talk about a lot of the different features of the class today and hopefully fill you in on some information uh, that's probably pretty important to you. I'm going to mix in some of the stuff related to the course structure as I'm setting it up and also some information about minor things that you might be interested in like when we're doing exams, uh, how we're calculating grades and what kind of a project we'd like you to do and so forth. So we'll try to spend a little bit of time on the mechanics today before we actually start looking at the history of how we got to where we are in terms of the study of, of cognitive processes. So basically Basically, if we start off, we'll start looking at the, um, the nature of the course structure itself and the various elements of that. And the first thing I'm going to spend some time talking about is the syllabus for the course as a whole. You will normally find that in the um, um, Cognitive Psych, the book, book that is the lecture notes for the entire class. It's typically on the, the, first, the reverse side of the first page in the book. And in that syllabus, what we're going to talk about is everything from broadcast days to vacation days, uh, all of that will be listed on the front, uh, on that sheet in your book. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump directly to a copy of that sheet with a couple of cautions. One is, um, and this, this sheet will be similar to the one that you're holding in your hands at the moment, even though you may be viewing this in a later semester than it's actually being taped. But I want to review each of the elements of what you're looking at and don't pay attention particularly to the, tape, the dates, although it looks like they're small enough you probably can't read them anyway on the, um, on the screen but all of the specific current applicable to be believed dates for the course are always on this particular syllabus. That is, if I sometimes slip up, as I won't try not to, during the course of the semester and talk about next week or next lecture or, or um, two days from now or something like that, ignore it from your own life. Uh, the, the only things that will be relevant are the dates that are mentioned in the syllabus, and I'm going to highlight each of those for you as we, as we go through it. This is a pretty small print, too much print on the screen, but at least the position of what I'm talking about in each case will be, will be relevant there. So the first thing on the syllabus on the left side is, this, is the lecture number and that'll run from 1 to 26. So we're actually going to give you a total of, of 13 weeks worth of lectures because the exams are also part of the course but they will be done typically on Friday evenings. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. But the result is we'll do 13 weeks worth of material and then a week's worth of exam material. So we'll give you time off for examinations um, when we'll be holding them later on. So the, the tape number is indicated there. Then the next thing has to do with the play-by date. Now, life is changing right now. That is, uh, a lot of the courses that we have traditionally offered through distance education are offered by television, uh, and that is gradually changing. So there's still televised lectures, but they tend to be available not on the local television station but on the internet. And so what I'm going to do when I talk about play-by dates or dates for this, that, or the other thing is I am suggesting that these are the dates by which you should view each of the things that we're talking about. Uh, my head tends to be wrapped around television dates and the day of playing, but, but the, uh, the play-by date means essentially that what I'm suggesting is that that's the time by which you ought to have viewed it, whether you're doing it by internet, CD, tape, or directly on television in the old-fashioned way. Um, so that'll be the, the second column in, on the syllabus. The next column will involve the, the particular topic or event that is involved, and for the most part, that will be chapter labels. That is, we'll be talking about section titles there. So we'll start with this introduction, which we're going to finish today and then move into, I doubt we'll have time today, but we'll move into um, perception as the first of many topics that we'll also be uh, discussing and so forth. So in essence, in the, in the syllabus, the third event is simply the topic or event that we're actually talking about in that. Next to that um, is the date that things are due. That's a relatively crucial date for you because in essence what that's talking about is, is the, the first of all the topics that are going to be discussed we've just talked about but the postmark or due date indicates the dates on which course related assignments must be postmarked because since we're doing this as distance education many times you will be mailing things in um, or they'll be delivered to, to my office where I'll show you a little bit later here. Uh, either way what will be relevant for you is the date either the post mark of what you turn in, that's, that's considered to be the due date since you're not necessarily sitting right next to me or the time that you turn it in. So if you're running late, you may want to work feverishly and then drive frantically to the office on the due date. But in essence, what we're trying to do there is to level the playing field. I'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, but in essence, the, the, um, 
the, the due date is either the postmark date or the date that you actually turn it in and we'll give you the locations and everything if you decide to physically turn things in uh, a little bit later here. The one thing I forgot to mention was that the tapes will be numbered on that tape number uh, left side of the uh, syllabus there and that'll be uh, if I'm ever talking about tape 1, tape 7, tape 23, whatever it happens to be, that one you can believe that's, that's related to the, the topic number that's on the, um, on the syllabus there. So the parse mark due date is essentially when it needs to be turned in or the time by which you need to uh, present it to the uh, post office for them to stamp it. And finally then, um, there is, well not finally, but also, there is a section labeled or a column labeled project assignment. These are what have to be completed um, throughout the course, throughout the varying parts of the course. Let me also point out, however, that if you'll check on that, uh, on that uh, syllabus, the one that you're looking at, and given the one that I'm talking about, you will notice that one of the early lines in there is the, the last date by which you can drop the course at 11.59 p.m. without having it count as a W. That is, in your life as a student, I've, uh, people have probably talked to you a lot about this, but I am amazed how many people don't understand it. The legislature has now passed rules, which means that if you get more than six W's in your total record, you're going to start paying out-of-state tuition for any additional courses you take. So they really are interested in having you not uh, kind of shop around courses, then drop eight of them and, and decide which five you're actually going to keep any given semester. So the, the reason I put that date in there is not because it's directly relevant to our course, I hope, but it is the last day on any course in a given semester by which you can drop in order to get a, um, in order to avoid getting a W. That is up until that date, I'm not obligated to give you a W, but beyond that time, I will have to give you a W if you back out of the course and in fact any instructor will be obligated to so that's a university date um, and this particular semester I'm kind of eyeballing it but I would guess it's probably about two weeks into the um, into the semester figure a week and a half but it's a date worth checking at any given time that's the due date um, the second one the second due date there we'll talk about just uh, a little bit later so in essence basically these are the kind of things that I've talked about across the top of the sheet first the tape number the play-by or event date, when things are going to happen, um, the specific topic that will be happening, the due date for anything that is, is uh, needing to be turned in at a given time, and then the specific project or assignment that's, that's actually involved there. Um, in addition, there's one other topic that I um, avoided at the, on the spreadsheet, uh, the, the sheet that I was just showing you, the syllabus, and that is that essentially this one. This is going to show you the textbook chapter that you need to read. So there are basically two components in this course. One is the cognitive psych, the book, book, uh, which is a topical outline of everything I'm talking about. You will find that it makes taking lecture notes markedly easier. Uh, I have, as you'll observe, a tremor. And I used to really get annoyed in chemistry classes when they'd have an, uh, an image up on the screen for some period of time, undeclared as to how long it would be there. And I was frantically trying to copy it down. And then after lecture, I was equally frantically trying to figure out what the heck I had drawn. So for my purposes, I have given you a copy of everything that will be relevant in terms of a, uh, a table with relevant figures, um, a figure, or anything else that I'm going to be talking about in any kind of detail. You've got a copy of it in the uh, Cognitive Psych, the book. book. So what all this piles down to is essentially that column on the right is essentially the textbook chapter that needs to be read. And the assignments uh, readings are listed by chapter number on the right side of the sheet there. This particular sequence, we will be going through the book uh, in order because I happen to like the way uh, Professor Matlin has organized the material and there's no reason to disturb that so that the material will be integrated across that book through the entire uh, semester. Uh, in the future, the, we may reorder that in certain cases if we end up switching a book. I probably won't do that. We'll tend to use succeeding editions of this one. But if it ever shows up that there's a better book to be done, then you may want to pay attention to those chapter numbers. But in general, we should be going through it in the order that it's listed on the, um, on the page there. Let me come back and look at another feature of the um, Oh yes, I'm going to give you a series of hints to survive and thrive here in getting through the course, okay? Number one is absolute, and it's true in any class. Read the material before the lecture or discussion. 
I have an electronic text that I use in my introductory sections, and it is amazing. We get that set up once we've gotten through the first semester, the first exam. It's all set up so that everybody has to finish the reading before we actually talk about it in class. You'd be amazed how much more material we can cover and how much better the average discussion is in that class. So in general, I would suggest that what you do is organize your life around making sure that you get the reading done um, before we cover any particular topic. View that uh, play-by date as, as also the deadline date for the chapter that's listed over on the, on the right side, on the right column there. So that's where the uh, chapter numbers are listed. Let me point out another feature related to the text, uh, to the uh, syllabus, I mean, and that has to do with class meetings. There are going to be three that we have to do here given the way distance education is currently working. Now this feature may end up changing given that the technology is changing so much these days, but for now we've got a, um, a compromise position that I think will work pretty well. If you look in the syllabus, you will find that there are lettered events, A, B, and C. The one that, you, that is circled there that you really can't quite see is simply the occurrence of the, um, of the first exam. It, it, there are actually two events that occur there. It's a Friday night, almost always a Friday night, very little competition I find for doing exam stuff on Friday nights. So we'll have a review at seven o'clock. Um, the first one is required. That is by the, the Board of Regents, you are required to be at least once in a distance education class. So that's the one we do. You're gonna be coming in for an exam anyway. So we do the required meeting and we'll do it as a review, reviewing, talking about your independent project. Uh, if you have problems with that, uh, anything about the first third of the course and so forth. Trust me, no new information will be presented. A review is just that. It's going back over what you've already, already learned. So there shouldn't be a problem there. But the first one will be required. The second and third will be optional. Uh, your, your choice as to whether you come in or not. So in general, the timing will be such that the review and general information session will last maybe 30 minutes, figure starting at seven o'clock. So we'll normally start the exam at 7.30. Um, unless we've run out of things to talk about and people want to go ahead and start earlier. Um, but that will be event A, and then B is going to be the second exam covering roughly the middle third of the course, and then exam event C is going to be the third and final exam. Hear me when I say that, okay? Event A and B are going to start at seven, 30 minutes of review, no new information. Insofar as possible, all exams and reviews for the first two will be held on Friday nights, okay? In general, you can plan on that. The third and final are more dictated by when the university assigns exam times to us. So that often will be shifted to a Thursday night rather than a Friday. So just be, be careful of that. I will try to know by the time a syllabus is created when the exam time is going to be as we do this particular semester. But just double check that and be sensitive to the fact that where the first two A and B events are done on Thursday, a Friday night, the, uh, the last exams may be done on, um, on Thursday night. Now, let me also jump then to looking at one other thing that will be relevant to you, and that is tests. Um, we're going to, um, I want to make a couple of comments about that, and that is there are gonna be four exams during the course of the semester. Each of them will be 50 items, okay? Multiple choice, not essay, multiple choice. They won't involve figures, you won't have to draw anything in. So you just need to learn the use of very, you know, when we have a diagram, and we'll have some, uh, what the main purpose of that will be for you to learn the, the structure of what is being talked about, how it operates and uh, where it's located and so forth. Uh, so the content, uh, the intellectual content of a figure is more important than the physical content of it, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm not gonna be asking you to draw uh, the hypothalamus and its position in the brain or anything like that, so relax. Um, that's not my, my view of, of what cognitive psychology is. The other thing that I want to point out to you is this feature, and that is that if you look down at the bottom where the, the third and final tests are shown, they are given at the same time. Every now and then I have people that come in panicky two or three days after the scheduled exam and tell me, oh, you did the test at, well, yes. And we do both the third and the final at the same time. I'll show you a little bit later when we do the grades, uh, when I show you how the grades are calculated, why it's important, why it's significant that I do it that way. But in essence, you're gonna get both the third exam, which covers the last third of the course, and the final, which is cumulative. That is, it'll cover everything about half an inch deep uh, of what we've talked about. So you'll actually end up with five grades during the course of the semester. Four grades on the exams and the independent project, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, and then assuming you've done all five of those, we'll drop the lowest. 
okay? So the lowest grade will be dropped. So if your grandmother dies, don't worry about it. You are excused to go take care of family business in that case. Don't, you don't even have to worry me about, uh, or yourself, about getting an excuse or anything like that. It's, a, it's an automatic drop for one of the five pieces of data we're gonna collect from you. So your grade will be based ultimately on four out of the five best performances that you, uh, that you do. Um, and so those are basically the key elements of the test. There'll be four of them. The third and the final will both be given at the time of the final. You're thinking that's a lot of pressure. It really isn't because the each individual hour exam takes about an hour, maybe an hour and five minutes, but the average person is out of there in, in an hour, an hour and five minutes. Uh, and so we're gonna do two of those in a three hour final exam period. So you won't be rushed. There'll be plenty of time for you to get through the, um, get through the material, hopefully without too much difficulty. Okay, so then let's talk about those projects. <coughs> Excuse me. You've heard me use that word a couple of times. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is the four tests covering the intellectual content, and then we're also going to ask you to do a creative project. And by that, what I mean is there are two ways to do this, and I'll talk about the second one here in a minute. But um, we're going to actually do two different kinds of activities uh, or set up, propose to you that you do one of two different kinds of activities. Um, they're going to cut from the, the PowerPoint that you're looking at to a um, picture that I'm holding up here in front of me in just a minute. Uh, and they maybe, let me see if I can tip it down so it doesn't reflect too much. That's about the best angle. Uh, if, they, if it's possible to zero in on that, it's marvelous to look at the detail of this. This was actually done from the introductory course, uh, but it is an example of the kind of creative project that I have in mind uh, in doing this particular kind of project. What I'd like you to do, look at the detail in the line drawing on that windowsill, for instance. It's just a phenomenally detailed line drawing. I'm not suggesting that all of you become artists uh, in this sense, but this is just to give you one sample of the kind of thing that could be done uh, with, this, with this effort. This is one project that we could do. Uh, that we could do. Um, shall I go ahead and switch to the other one while you're at the camera there? Hang on just a second. I've got a second one to show you, which is uh, creative in another way. You're watching my arm dexterity here. This one is a piece of stained glass, and it'll take a second here to get me set up. Um, I want to do that so it doesn't reflect, and then I want to do one thing. What I'm going to do is move white paper behind it so you can get a little bit of a feel for what's actually involved. This one is very difficult to illustrate unless you're actually holding it. But if you can see it, what this person did was to get a PET scan of somebody, the activity level of someone's head, brain, cranium, when they're talking. Not when they're listening, but when they're talking. And so in essence, what's reflected here is, is a, a piece of stained glass that reports or shows you what's actually going on in the brain in terms of electrical activity given a particular activity, and that is communicating outward talking rather than listening. That's another example of what I consider to be a very, a very creative project. Okay, so we'll cut back to the um, PowerPoint as time permits. But basically, that's to give you at least a couple of feels. Now, you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not an artist. Well, personally, neither am I. Um, but there are a number of other possibilities. Um, to give you an example, somebody did a, um, a game. What they did was to take a chess game, and they cast uh, particular figures. And instead of using uh, the pawns, the queen, the king, and so forth, what they did instead was to vary people by age. That is, it was a project built around cognitive development. And so in that case, the, although the, the, the representative pieces were interesting, the project was really built around the instruction book, which was eight pages of instructions on how you were to play chess with these people. And what they did was basically to cater their instructions to the nature of the uh, age of the players. And so they started with the pawns, the shortest pieces who, as you know, in chess can move forward one or two places and that's all. And they built a, a set of instructions for how you operate a, a two-year-old, uh, essentially, uh, in terms of they're able to take one or two steps at a time, but they have to be watched very carefully because, of course, sometimes they wander off in different directions, which is beyond chess. But in fact, it was simply built around the idea of the rules of chess. 
And then they got to the instructions for the king and queen at the end, um, where they had graded age instructions all the way up. The king and queen were considered to be the seniors, the, the grandparents in the family unit. Um, they were, as you know, able to move in varying directions. The queen could move anywhere as far as she wanted. Uh, the king could move anywhere he wanted, but he had to do it in a more limited basis. And what she did was to tie that back to the fact that sometimes, of course, what happens is once they get there, they forget why it was they went over to that particular place. And so she basically used those instructions to integrate all sorts of different features related to memory, um, de cognitive development as a function of age, and, and so forth. So again, the idea here is creativity. What we're asking you to do is some kind of a right hemisphere creative act. And we've almost never refused people. I mean, we will show, talk a little bit later about an approval sheet, but basically, um, the idea is that you simply do any kind of a creative act that you'd like to and report on it. Give us a report of, of what, you want to, uh, what you want to do. And the sky's the limit in terms of what you might want to do. So I've, it isn't that I'm, I've, you know, I've been teaching this course for several years. I'm showing you some of the best that have been turned in. So don't figure that this is the minimum you've got to have for a, a C or anything like that. Relax. That's not that important. Um, I'll, I'm just trying to give you an idea, a feel for some of the efforts that have been done in those activities. Um, the other thing relevant to the project we should put on the screen, and that is that um, there's no paper, okay? I do not want a paper. What I want is a creative project. It's a different kind of assignment than what you normally get. We're going to educate the right hemisphere here instead of the less left hemisphere. Um, what that also leads to is the idea that it, the other one that I suggested, one was a creative act, if you would rather what you might want to do is work on a classroom demonstration of some sort. If you see me do something and can think of a better way to do it, or if there's something I don't cover and you can think of a way to do it, um, I'd be quite willing to, to approve a project in which you actually spend your time learning the principle that you're trying to illustrate and then providing a means by which to demonstrate it, whether it be an illusion, uh, a series of PowerPoint illustrations, whatever. Um, so I, my emphasis and the reason I've spent so much time on it is that I think the creative act is, is really the more interesting one. That's the one that will ultimately teach you more. But uh, if you're interested in doing a classroom demonstration, that would be another possibility in this particular situation. Now, we're going to come back to me and we're going to talk about another very important element of what's involved. And that is in order to make sure that we have some control over what you're doing, you will find that the very last page in the, t in the uh, Cognitive Psych, the book book, is an approval sheet related to the, the, um, the independent project. Take the time to study that sheet because it is important that you turn that in. You will notice on the syllabus that about three or four weeks in uh, from the semester, from the beginning of the semester, unless it's a summer session, in which case it goes by much more rapidly, but uh, perhaps 20% of the way through the class, you will be turning this in with your summary. Give us enough information so that we can make an intelligent decision about what you're planning to do is worthwhile or not, okay? This sheet is for your benefit because I want you to understand that we don't want a master's thesis or a PhD level dissertation. That's not the goal here. Keep in mind that this is only one fifth of a three semester hour course and I want you to treat it that way. I don't want you to kill yourself with the project. That's not the intent to overload you. It is rather to educate you. And in order to make sure, one of the things we have down at the bottom is an approval list where the TA will initial approved, see me or unapproved. The vast majority, if they're not approved, the, I should say the vast majority are approved, but of those that are, that are less than approved, the vast majority of those are simply see me. Uh, not necessarily me, but the person who signed the sheet. And the intent there is either to give you more information about, about uh, what to do, what you're trying to do, how to, how to do what you're trying to do, or they may be suggesting that you cut down. We almost never have to expand a project. Many times we've had to tell people to cut it down because you're trying to bite off too much. We don't want to kill you on this. We're just trying to give you a nice, reasonable cognitive psych experience in the course of, of doing this. So you need to submit the approval sheet. It is critical and thus unapproved projects may not be graded. Hear that because what we will do is collect this, as I said, about three or four weeks into the semester uh, or you know, 20% into the semester. We will turn this sheet back to you at the first exam. When we have that first meeting, this sheet will also be there 
and you should not leave the first exam without having an independent project approved. Okay, you might want to write that in your notes because it's nowhere said directly in the, in the course information. But make sure you have this done or taken care of. Earlier is fine if you want to get started on something, but make sure that not later than the first exam you've got this sheet filled out and approved. It is also important to note about general features of the, of the thing. Um, it is asking you either are you going to develop a, a, um, a creative project of some sort or are you going to do a, a classroom demonstration. In either case, use this space to detail for us a little bit about what you're going to do. Just as one student talking to another, what are you planning to do and how do you think it will demonstrate something about psychology, uh, cognitive psychology, creatively. We also need information from you about who you are. When you fill this out, and I, with the lousy handwriting I've got, I can make this as a demand and justify it. Print. Make sure you're legible, okay, when you do the, the information on this, because if we can't read it, we may not be able to email a suggestion if, if it's such that we can email you and correct any difficulty you have or make any suggestions that you may tend to have. For the most part, this is the side that we want to have filled out at the beginning. This, you will notice, becomes the cover sheet of your project at the end. Now, just because there's a staple mark up here, there are two things about that. If you're submitting something in writing, a project being described in writing, that's where you're going to staple it rather than tape it and scot uh, you know staple it five times across. If you're doing a piece of art or something like that, you don't have to staple this in the middle of it. You can tape it just as long as it's attached because the biggest problem we have, not the biggest, but a problem we have with the projects is once they come in, if they get separated from this approval sheet, you may lose points that you had really earned properly. Also, please do us the favor of turning this in with the project, okay? because it's very difficult once the system, once your project has been turned in, necessarily to find it. Any of several people may be grading it, and it can be a little difficult to translate this back to the project itself. Um, but it's pretty self-explanatory if you just read through the, um, read through the sheet there. Um, you can turn it in either of two ways, uh, and this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about level the playing field. Um, you can postmark it, and that's fine, as long as that's done by any particular date. And this is true of anything in the course, but if there's something time date required, you can postmark it. The other possibility is to turn it in at that time. Okay, my intent on that is to level the playing field because I just don't react well when everybody else makes, meets the deadline, whenever it is, you know, three quarters of the way through the semester, and there's one person who comes in a week later and has all sorts of excuses about why they couldn't do it. Okay, I really, don't care. I think it's fair to everybody that if we specify a deadline, it's like taxes. If there's a deadline, you've got every time up till then, but once it's due, it's due. And then you can move on to something else. And so that's the way it will be treated. If it is not turned in on time, an unapproved project will not be accepted. Okay? It isn't a matter of grading it. It won't be accepted. So save yourself the problem. Um, of, of handling that, and I'll have some more comments on that here in a couple of minutes. Let me just review my notes to make sure I told you everything that I want to. Um, and so again, the intent is simply to level the playing field. If you need to keep it until the last day, you're going to have to bring it in. Uh, it may be a lot easier to postmark it, but that either way, whether it's delivered or um, brought in, uh, that's the turn in time as far as we are concerned, because once it's in the postal system, you can't reach it. They may not be able to either, but you certainly won't be able to. Um, if you turn it in at my office, sometimes I'm in, sometimes I'm not in, I would strongly recommend when you're turning in any project, not just this one, but any project, hand it to somebody. Don't just leave it in somebody's mailbox. Evil people are out in the world and they may take your project. You ever thought about that? So make sure you hand it either to the receptionist at the main door of the psych department if my office isn't open or slide it under my office door. I'm the only one in my office, so there's not a problem with sliding it under my office door if you want to do that. But you're always safer if you hand it to someone. Okay? And ultimately, if we ever get to the point where you're saying, I turned it in, I put it somewhere, the burden of proof is on you, not me. Okay? And that's true of any instructor generally. Make sure that you hand it to somebody, typically me or the teaching assistant uh, who's helping me, assistant or assistants. Um, or to the receptionist in the main office. They get a little provoked because we get quite a stack of projects there sometimes, but, but they will accept it from you and gladly um, if that becomes important. So we go back to the screen now and give you a couple of more pieces of, of general information here, one of which is 
Hint number two, which is to survive and thrive in the course, recognize that the project is designed to be and will be graded as a semester long project, okay? What you need to do is to schedule your time if you're developing a schedule in terms of this particular project. That is, that should be a component that's factored into the way you organize your life. Don't wait until 10 weeks into the semester in a regular semester to start it or five weeks in in the summer semester to start it. Start now. I have a colleague, a friend, a good friend who teaches uh, motivation and motion at the University of Texas and he got into quite a disturbing argument with his students several years ago in intro when he was doing an intro section where he came in early September in the fall semester, early August, uh, mid-August I guess when they started fall semester and on the second or third day when he was discussing projects and everything he indicated what the nature of the project was that he wanted and he announced right there with a straight face we're talking about this on August 25th or whenever it was. Uh, the project will be due on September 1st. And there was general panic in the room. Six days to do this project? I've got to have more time and so forth. And as he pointed out at the time, if I give you this assignment in August, you're still not going to work on it until, until mid-November when it's due. And so you're going to start a weekend. If it's due on a Monday, you're going to start the preceding Friday, work the entire weekend, and then turn it in Monday exhausted. So I figure, since you're fresh now, I'll just have the deadline due at the beginning of the semester. You'll work feverishly this weekend and then be done with it. And the project quality won't be all that different. And everybody was, oh, no, 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 we've got to have all that time and so forth and so on. End of semester, sure enough, as I just went through this at the close of last semester, I had people calling me literally on Friday before a project was due on Monday trying to get their approval sheet. It had been signed and available in mailboxes outside my office door forever. Um, but, you know, three days before the project, they were ready to, to, uh, to get their approval done. So plan ahead. Think about it a little bit, because it, it's, it's, it's deliberately a little more complex than average. We're not asking you to write a paper. We're asking you to do something creative. And that may take some time for you to come up with something. The people who are assisting me or me will be quite willing to, uh, to work with you in terms of what you propose to do, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. There's going to be a two grade penalty on your final project for any project that is unapproved if we do grade it. Okay? We will simply, because of the time pressures at the end of the semester, we will grade first those that are A on time and B approved. Okay? Um, we will then make the next priority those that are unapproved but still in. Uh, but I would strongly recommend, since it's only to help you, that you consider getting that, that approval taken care of problems we have with grading are simply the fact that, that by the end of, of fall semester, we have an awful lot of papers to grade. Uh, end of spring semester, everybody is, is moving toward, and I'm dealing with, with graduate teaching assistants who also have courses. So they've got pressures on them, which limits the amount of time I can impose on them for reading projects. So just kind of keep the, the overall environment in mind and things should work uh, pretty rapidly, but uh, pretty effectively. But in the absence of an approval sheet, your project may not be graded. The final report, as I said, has to be postmarked or turned into, a, as a, into a, a teaching assistant. They will be returned at the time of the final. If they're available beforehand, I will let you know by email. That is, you'll know when, they, when everything has been graded. Um, but uh, stay in tune if, if you're interested in trying to pick it up earlier. But we will definitely have, you, have it and can typically show it to you before you take the final exam. Um, please note, the late project final reports will not be accepted, okay? The deadline is the deadline, and that's, that's what it's meant to be. Okay, so now what we're going to do is go look at things like, whoops, if that was simply an additional piece of information I was going to give to you to recognize the import of this project in, in terms of the course as a whole. If you bomb it, that's the grade that'll be dropped, but we do want an earnest effort, okay? So the next thing we're going to look at then is homework assignments. And how do you send them, how do you turn them in, any assignment, and we don't have that many other than the project itself, but where do you send them? What do you do with them? Well, in essence, if you're going to mail it to me, this is the address, okay? Your name somewhere on the envelope, and my address, my name down at the bottom, Richard A. Cashaw, Department of Psychology, University of Houston, Houston, Texas, and the zip there is 77204-5341. All right, it turns out because each of the, um, wait a minute, I gave you the wrong one there. 
No, that's right, 5341. I was panicky there for a second. Um, I have one other favor to ask of you, and I'm gonna show you how to do it here. Anytime you communicate with us, make sure that you put on the outside of the envelope the course number. Because I have tried insofar as possible, since I normally do two courses by, uh, by distance ed, I have tried to separate the deadlines, but there is invariably an overlap in, in the materials. And so to save us having to open each project, it would be very helpful anytime you write to us by, by snail mail, if you would simply put the 3350 for this course somewhere on that envelope or the postal label that you've used or anything like that, okay? If you're turning it in physically, then it will be possible to come to the Heine building, which is where we're located. It's in room, my office is 107. The main departmental office is on the opposite side of the hallway, much closer to the other end of the building than my office is in. To get to it, you go to entrance 13A, and if you've come into the campus by coming off the Gulf Freeway, which is the way many people do, um, not counting the lights that are right at the Gulf Freeway, Entrance 13A is to your left as you get to the fourth traffic light. So as you're coming across the campus, it's the fourth traffic light from the Gulf Freeway. Hang a left there and you're in our parking lot. And it's at, of course, the University of Houston. Hint number three for survival. Set priorities, okay? Continue working on scheduling your time and integrate the project into that. That is, allow time to work on that. Get on it right now and get it in on time. To show you what I mean by prioritizing what you're doing, I do a daily schedule in the introductory class. And I had one student a couple of years ago who handed in, they, you know, they get to indicate many hour, number of hours resting, studying, driving, parking, study, uh, studying, um, um, working, and so forth and so on. One student turned in, believe it or not, 27 hours of Nintendo playing. <laughs> He wanted to keep track of how he did things, and so he simply recorded 27 different hours, Nintendo. Even more stunning than that was the student who turned in that same schedule, different semester, but the same schedule, and if you can believe it, reported 56 hours of television watching. Nothing more than TV for 56 hours. I couldn't believe it when I saw the schedule. The next day in class, I asked him, you know, it was a summer class. Uh, the next day in class, I asked him, you know, how on earth, why did you spend 56 hours watching television? And his response was very simple. Well, I was only enrolled in one class. As if there's nothing else you can do other than watch TV. You rip yourself away from television to go watch a class, uh, go take a class or something. But in any case, um, you may be surprised how much time you waste. So set your priorities. Make sure that you got things organized in such a way that you can get through it. It's not that hard to survive in a university. So then we're gonna look at grades. How are we gonna do that? And I should have developed a nice fancy visual, but I forgot to here, uh, ran out of time. Um, if you take all four tests and complete the independent projects, then what I will do is drop the lowest of those five scores, whichever one it happens to be. Now, quick minds, inquiring minds, immediately jump to the idea, well, I don't have to take the final. Well, no, you don't. But if you think about it a second, it's a win-win situation. Because all you have to do, the only thing you have to aspire to on the final is better than the worst of the other four grades, and the final will be counted, and that lower grade will be dropped, okay? So in essence, when it comes time to, to, um, to whether or not to take the final, I would strongly, don't even ask, I will tell you, yes, you should do so. You've already had to pay the babysitter. And again, all you have to do is, is if, if, if that's your worst grade, on that final, you simply have to get better than that grade and that one will be counted and that final, will, the other one will be dropped. So basically, if the final ends up being the worst, we'll drop it so you can't hurt yourself. If it's better than the worst of your other grades, it's helped you. So it's a win-win situation. Either way, should you take it? Definitely, go ahead and take it. And finally then, hint number four, to survive and thrive in the course, is to make sure that you first of all recognize the importance of the independent project and the tests, and then revise your schedule in terms of how you're currently planning it for a little more time than you'd probably plan to devote on the one frantic weekend to the independent project. That does carry equal weight to the exams, representing a third of the class. So you may want to revise your schedule in terms of 
the demands of that uh, of that project. I really I put a lot of emphasis on that because I think that's really where you teach yourself a great deal of cognitive psychology is simply looking at it, grappling with what, what is the idea of creativity. And we'll have a chapter of, of material on it, a, a couple of lectures on that in general. Um, I've already talked about that. Let's also look at the, the various other mechanisms here. Things are changing pretty rapidly. We used to do everything by television. We now have the, the tapes and CDs. There are copies of the course always available in the library, so if, if your computer blows up or something bad happens, there is always a copy of the most recent version of the course available on the, in the reserved reading room in the library. When you go into the main MD Anderson library, up half a flight past the entry gates and the circulation desk, hang a right, and that's the, the reserved reading room. So you can get in there um, and find copies of the discs. <clears throat> Excuse me. The one thing I would recommend that you not do is don't plan to view the tapes the last day. If you're going to use that system, don't plan to do it the last day because there are a bunch of other people in the class and they may also have planned to. Um, so figure that they may be a little bit tougher to get to just prior to any particular exam. And the fifth hint then in terms of how to survive here is stick to it, okay? To survive and thrive, do not rely on the availability of those tapes at the end to study feverishly in the hours just before the exam. The story that I always love to tell is that it's very difficult to get a discussion going just before the exam because people tend to avoid the principles of the SQ3R technique on how to study. And so they walk in with this very delicately constructed structure of what relates to which and how everything relates to anything else. And they're sitting there very nervously just before the exam, praying that nobody talks to them. The image in mind being that this whole structure is going to collapse and be useless if anybody interacts with you. So don't, don't master it at that level. What you should do instead is, is go into it long enough. Don't study a figure we talked about a little bit in the first tape. Don't look at a figure just as a picture. Look at what the, what the, what's the principle that it's trying to teach to you. And that's true in any class, not just this one. Okay? So um, Let's see what we're gonna talk about here. Oh yes, um, the one other thing about stick to it is distributed practice, we'll talk about this a little later in the class, but there is one investigator, Benton Underwood, uh, who back in the 1950s and 60s actually published something like 35 or 36 consecutive Roman numeral studies in journals like the Journal of Experimental Psychology, the original version of that, that demonstrated in 35 out of 36 studies that distributed practice is better. We'll talk later about why. But what he was saying basically was that if you have only an hour to spend in mastering anything, it is better to spend four sessions of 15 minutes spread out over time than it is to, to do the whole thing an hour just before you need it. You'll end up with, with um, better memory, better retention of the material you've studied. So distributed practice is better than mass practice. And then also let me talk about, um, I've got only one other thing I want to talk about here by way of communication before we start looking at a preview of the course, and that has to do with specifically communication. And in fact, in terms of communication, there are several different things I want to suggest. First of all, the most obvious technique is to use email, okay? If you do that, what I would suggest is that you, you contact one of the TAs first, okay? That would be the first choice in most problems if you have the information that we can give to you. Contact the TA first. That's my email address if you need to reach me. It's very easy, it's just my last name, at uh.edu. And then one strong recommendation, and that is that you not contact more than one of us. If there happen to be two or three TAs helping me in the, in the semesters when there are more uh, larger numbers of students involved, pick one and develop a working relationship with him or her and try to get the problem resolved with them. But don't send a blanket email to every TA and, and me at the same time. That tends to produce very negative effects for you. Uh, it goes to the bottom of my list, among other things. Uh, so please pick one of us, um, preferably one of the TAs first, and, and handle it that way. Beyond that, if you've got problems, I have several different addresses that I want to give to you, okay? So if we do have problems, that is the number one place to go, okay? It's a 24-hour hotline. 
helpline, I should say, that operates during the regular semesters. That is, when school in session, this number is available 24 hours a day. Between sessions, it's a little more nine to five, and when the school is on vacation, you will not be able to reach them. But in general, perhaps the single most important thing to do through this number is to forward your email, because I have already sent a couple of emails at this point uh, in any course, I've already sent at least a couple of emails to people. First of all, uh, uh, before the semester, usually a note of, of welcome and, and encouragement, and then at the start of the semester, the details of how the course is going to operate by now has already gone out. See, he says, putting pressure on himself. If you haven't received an email from me by now, that's the first place to go because you may or may not be aware, although as juniors, seniors, all of you should be, when you were admitted, an email address was assigned to you. And that is, believe it or not, the university's official means of communication with you. So if you're not hearing a lot from the university, what you might want to do is contact the 31411 number because they will give you instructions, assist you in forwarding that mail, that email address, to your own favorite email. So if you work instead on Hotmail or Gmail or one of the others, simply forward that email. It's easy to take care of and it will make it a lot easier for me to communicate to you because that's what I will be doing. I will try to use um, um, WebCT as we talk about it a little bit later, um, but that's, that's one uh, probably the most reliable is to make sure that you're getting emails, not just in this course, but in any course. And that's the number at which you should do it. Secondly, if you have troubles with the tape, something doesn't happen when it's supposed to, that's the main number for distance education. By all means, contact them. Let them earn their salary. They're good folks. Uh, but if you have troubles with the mechanics of the course in some way, those would be the people to contact. If you're having trouble getting onto WebCT, check them or check the website itself uh, through the University of Houston. That's the number to use, three, if you're on campus, 33327. And finally then, if all else fails, I hate to release this, but you're welcome to it, actually, because it's publicly available anyway. And that is my extension on campus is 38521. And if you ever need to fax anything to me, it's, it's similar, and that can be a problem sometimes. But it's 38588 for the psychology department. Uh, I generally don't like faxes. I'd rather get the original, if possible. Um, but these are the procedures by which to, to reach whoever you need to in this particular situation. Okay, so those are the relevant figures. I'll leave those up for just a second. And then what I'd like to do is to move into a, a review of the course as we're, going to be, uh, as we're going to be offering it here. Okay. So we're gonna start a review. The introduction has faded just as rapidly as that image just did. So we're already launched into the class. So now what we're gonna do is a preview. Basically, I'm going to show you kind of a, a cursory outline, a short outline of what we'll be talking about through the course of the, um, of the semester. The very first general area we're going to, to uh, look at is perceptual processes. This is one case where the, the syllabus will change from what has previously been used because uh, Dr. Matlin has, has doubled the amount of information she has in perception and cut down slightly on the uh, offerings in, in study of, of memory processes and so forth. So we will appropriately also adjust course content here. But this will cover um, a variety of things. For instance, if you read this word, what is it? You need to press the mic button to give me the correct answer and get credit for it, and I'll wait for you. What is the word? Face. Face, yes. Okay, keep an eye on the screen. What is this word? This is not that hard. What is this word? Safe. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> and I realized as soon as I heard fave why that's happened, because that's a word that has developed since I originally developed this demonstration. We'll come back and talk about that later. But in fact, there's another equally logical reading for that. If you saw that word without having seen the previous one, how might you then instead read it? Save, S-A-V-E. And my point was that what we're, what we're engaging in here is one of the elements of, of recognition, in visual recognition. It's just amazing that the demonstration didn't work, but there's a linguistic explanation as to why it didn't. But the last time I did this, even as recently as three or four years ago, 
uh, the demonstration worked fine. That is, people looked at it and, and went, um, um, used, the, used it as F and then used it as, as S, face and then save. The point being that that same kind of vague symbol can be viewed either as an S or an F under the context in which it's, in which it's presented. Okay, and that is but one of the elements of, of uh, perception that we'll be looking at during the course of, the, of the, um, our examination of that. That is, what are the, what are the factors that determine how we, how we uh, perceive something? And one of those is, is simply the, the context within which something appears, okay? The next section that we'll look at in terms of, of perception um, is, is a related and very important process, and that has to do with what you're paying attention to. If I ask you to, to just, I'm gonna get quiet here in just a second. What I'd ask you to do is just pay attention for just a moment. See how many different things you can actually hear, whether you're in the studio here or, or in your own home or sitting at your desk. But what do you actually hear? And you see that you can focus there on, on if your television is making any sounds, there may be a buzz or a whistle uh, or something like that. When you take time away from my voice and or the image that you're looking at, you can begin to pick up other elements of the, of the environment that you've simply been ignoring up to this time. That is the idea of essentially attention. You're focusing a particular, you're paying attention to that particular feature of the environment, okay? Let me show you another example of that, and that is what I'd like you to do. I'm gonna put up an image here in a minute. What I would like you to do is to find the O, the letter O. And when you see the image, it'll be obvious that there is a way to, to find it in the, in the clutter of information that's there. But on the image that comes up, on the grid that comes up in a minute, find the O, okay, as rapidly as you can. You found it yet? Okay. Didn't snap right out at you, did it? Doubly so, because dirty man, I put it down near the bottom. And if you're reading right to left, as is normally happening starting from the upper left, you don't tend to get to that until very late in your overall examination. On the next one, I'd like you to find the Q, okay? Did it take you as long? Do you see the effect of similarity in that case? That is in the Q, there was a lot more, when you were trying to find a, a single O in the middle of Qs, there were a lot of those slash marks defining the Q that were interfering. They were, they were overloading you with Q marks that you didn't really want. And so isolating the, the O in that array was much more difficult than isolating the Q in this array of O's because the Q stands out with the, the extra uh, mark involved there. That's but one of the many factors that go into uh, how we find things, how we, how we pay attention and, and register it within our, uh, within our consciousness. That's one of the factors that we'll be, uh, that we'll be looking at during the course of, of, this, uh, of this activity. Then what we're going to do is switch into, after looking at perception, perceptual processes, we're going to be looking at a variety of ways in which we can conceptualize um, memory. And so in this case, um, which type of list among these two do you think would be easier to learn? A, set, a list like this or a list like that? And probably most people would tend to argue in favor of words. The data, the literature very clearly supports that, okay? And it, it has to do with the meaningfulness. Because the numbers, first of all, it's a more limited pool. Just the idea that there are 26 letters, only 10 numbers. But beyond that, uh, the numbers are so highly similar to one another um, that the, the, the word list uh, conjures up images of many different kinds of variable things. And in that variety, you gain ease of learning. And we'll be looking at those kind of factors as, the, as they impact what is called working memory. Pay attention to the way people talk because working memory is a word that is often violated. Um, what, 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 what people really mean is working memory rather than uh, there, there is confusion in, in the populace between working memory, traditionally called short-term memory, and long-term memory. In essence, the traditional definition now of working memory, the definition we now use, is that which is actively in your memory. Whatever you're thinking about right now is the only thing that's really in short-term memory. And as soon as you switch to something else, you have already, by definition, put it into, on the original model, your long-term memory. 
And people sometimes get very confused about that timeline. They think about short-term memory as being anything that's happened recently. Not necessarily true, given the definitions of those two terms. And we'll talk in more detail about why that becomes an important distinction in looking at working memory. Then we're going to look at long-term memory, okay? Think about it, for instance. If you met your high school valedictorian today, and I know among juniors and seniors, it may have been two or three, four years since you graduated, particularly given the nature of a typical student here at the U of H. Would you still recognize your, valed your high school valedictorian? Would you have recognized him or her when you first met him or her at the time of graduation? On the other hand, would you recognize that person 40 years from now? Because we're going to show you, we're going we're to demonstrate some, a phenomenal effect uh, originally developed at Ohio Wesleyan University where a fellow, an investigator there, was able to actually trace people back um, and he got he, what he did in a given town, a relatively small town in Ohio, he went back and got yearbook pictures as much as 40 or 45 years earlier and randomly mixed them with people who had not graduated, same general area of Ohio, but not in that high school. And he went to the local people in a given town and compared, gave them a true-false list. Did you go to high school with this person? And the hit rate on those that they'd gone to high school with was about in the, in the mid-90s. Stunningly accurate, even, as, even for people they had not seen in the intervening 40 years. So there are some things that can make material uh, memorable. And I will show you some of what those are. Because all you know that jumble of facts you come in for an exam with, there is a way to sort them out so that you can get to them when you need to. Take some work, but there is a way to do it. We'll talk about that in, in our view of, of long-term memory. And in essence, what I'm dealing with here is <coughs> essentially strategies and, and so forth. How you, how you end up using, given what we know about memory, how do you organize your, your learning to be able to utilize memory? For instance here, when you need to take something to work tomorrow or bring it to school or something like that, why is it helpful if you put your watch or one of your shoes or a piece of clothing where you never normally store it? Why does that actually help? Yeah, and the reason is basically that when you get up the next morning, you're looking for your watch, oh, wait a minute, I've got, you know, and you put it on the kitchen counter or you put it wherever you don't normally put it, and the very act of having done that will initiate in your thinking a consideration about why on earth did I do that? And that is what will normally remind you, oh yes, I was gonna take that pad of paper or that journal or that book, whatever. Um, so if you disrupt the normal process, that can be a very easy cue to remind you at the proper time to investigate what it was that you were trying to, uh, trying to seek. Now, um, let's look then at another shift that will occur in the course. We're gonna shift then from memory into an investigation of cognitive processes specifically. And there's several of those that we're going to look at. Imagery and map reading are a, a, um, a really interesting device. Um, some of this work traces all the way back to the work of Roger Shepard at Stanford fully half a century ago now, where he would show people images such as this pair of images. As you look at that, is the image on the right a rotated image of the one on the left or not? Are those the two images? Are those two images the same, basically? And it turns out what he was able to demonstrate is that there is a linear relationship between how far you have to rotate one image to match up the other one in terms of reaction time to correctly answer yes. Okay, which is just graphic illustration. It was really the first undeniable demonstration of the fact that certain things we do store as figures, not as words. Because if it were words, you could just mechanically translate from any position to any other position, and rotation, orientation wouldn't make a difference. But it clearly does. The further you have to rotate it, the longer it takes to do so, up to as much as five seconds. If we'd rotated that left figure as much as 180 degrees, it could be five seconds before you snap to the idea, oh, wait a minute, that is a match, just because it takes longer to rotate it. So we'll be looking at that aspect of, of, uh, of, of imagery and maps and so forth. Then we'll look at general knowledge, which kind of is, it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's a random category almost, but there are certain features that we'll be looking at uh, particularly. Um, for instance, what I'd like you to do is to name as many features as you can um, that are broadly shared by all apples. What kind of words occur to you when you think about apples? I'm gonna wait, but you've got a button. 
would name some general features of apples that would apply not to any specific apple, but across apples. Round. Round, okay, that's a good one. I hadn't thought of that, that's a good one. Firm. Firm. Yes, you gotta get on the button or they're not gonna hear what you're saying. I'll have to mumble everything for you. Just push the button and talk, it's easy. Okay, shape, substance, how about color? Tends to be red, although interestingly enough, a subset, and I've confirmed this in intro with 500 students voting, and a, a strong subset will actually envision a green apple rather than a red apple, but traditionally I think red is, is a, a word that applies here. Um, and in essence, we could continue a long time about that. It's seed bearing, it's spherical, the texture of the skin, the fact that it's edible. I mean, there are a lot of different features, all of which apply to all apples. But all of those are features just of the apples themselves. Um, what we could also do, however, is to mention that apple is but one among many other fruits that belong to different kinds of categories. For instance, they are a fruit, they're living, which elevates it even further, because then you include things like uh, monkeys, as but one example, fleas, and so forth. Um, and in essence, what that's leading up to is the idea of a network metal of model of memory. And we will be looking at, at some of that to show you what, what, what the advantages are of a, a network model. My, the introductory psych text that I have and have used for many years now uh, that I wrote is basically based on a, on a network model of memory. And I'll show you a little bit of the internal structure of how that book operates. Network model, very effective in helping us recall things. Now I'm gonna try this, let me see if I can do it. I A M Y A Pekingsay in A Y A Anguage Line A Old K Igpe Atenlay. Can you understand and comprehend what I was just saying? Language is the one that threw me. Trying to figure out where to break language, because in essence, to do that language, all you do is move the first syllable to the last and add A. And it's amazing how much it confuses the, the normal flow of, of word. I, I still haven't figured out how to say that. Language, so it'd be gwidge <laughs> lang Okay, that'll work. But in any case, that, what that does is foul up your comprehension. And that's, that's, it's simply because we've, we've, you know, we've applied a particular um, change, a code to the language that we're using. And if you don't understand it, uh, if you don't know the code or in a, a way to change it, it it's becomes incomprehensible. So one of the things with comprehension that is important is shared rule systems. And we'll talk some about that in the section on language. Another thing we'll look at relative to language is the issue of, of production. Ich kann nur ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen. Kannst du? Können Sie? What are the advantages of bilingualism? If you have a youngster who is bilingual, or even trilingual, how do you maintain it? My son, who's now 18, um, was uh, the child of an Indian and I, who were married and very much in love at the time. Um, it's gone other ways since, but it was a good marriage. At the, at that, at the time of three, that youngster could speak three languages, Tamil, which is an Indian language, English, and Spanish, because that, we had a lady staying with us who, whose primary language when we weren't there was Spanish. And I couldn't believe at one point that three-year-old came into the living room, asked me a question in English, the lady who was helping us answered him in Spanish, and my then wife responded in, in um, Tamil. And he never missed a beat. He was asking for an object, where it was located, what the color was, or some, there were three different things that he was asking. I answered one and two different languages just that rapidly. It took about five seconds for the entire sequence. So bilingualism raises some really interesting issues about language processing, and we'll look at that in, in, the, uh, in the last of the section related to, um, to language. Then we're going to go into another section which gets quite creative. Okay, problem solving and creativity. If you haven't seen this before in intro, I'm going to leave you with something that will bug you mercilessly. And it's this problem. Can you connect these nine dots with four straight lines without taking your pencil off the paper once you start drawing? You can start anywhere, but you only get four straight lines. And it turns out that many people in doing that, it's, that's a classic for starting uh, seminars on problem solving or something like that. Many people, when they hear that, write a rule for themselves that I didn't include. 
that as I told you very specifically, and I'll tell you again, connect these nine dots with four straight lines starting anywhere on the paper. You can start anywhere you want, but you can only draw four straight lines when you do so without removing your paper. And it can be done, it can be done easily. Um, but you've already written a rule for yourself where you won't be able to solve it until you break that rule, until you realize that that was not part of what I told you. And in essence, that's one of the elements that we'll be looking at in, in problem solving uh, and the related act of, of creativity, okay? It can be done. Don't waste a whole lot of time on it because I will show you what the correct answer is. But it is, it's one of those that will bug you until you figure out that there is a correct answer. And I can literally show you, it's a good illustration of observational learning. Because once I show you, it's very obvious how to do it. There's a, an easy rule to develop that will allow you to do it. But I'm not gonna tell you right now. We're just, we're just uh, surveying right now. Then we'll go into reasoning and decision making. What's the difference between these two questions? And this is the one that's kind of time sensitive here. If asked in late October, for whom would you have voted for president? For whom would you have stated that you were going to vote for president? Is one way to answer that question. Another way that some of the networks are essentially guilty of is, if asked in late October whether you favored a candidate who favored closing a prison, housing US enemies and releasing them, for whom would you have voted for president? And all that's involved there is a framing effect, okay? For those that are not, you know, if the tape is being used a little bit later, what I'm addressing there is the fact that President Obama, when he was, in, when he was in, actually when he was campaigning, was promising that he was going to close the prison in Cuba as one of the first acts of his presidency. Uh, and the way you ask that question of people in terms of what it was going to be the impact on their voting is basically tied up in how you frame it. Because in the latter case, you clearly stated your own bias before asking the person to state uh, uh, how they would end up voting. So framing can be important when you, when you start trying to impact people's uh, decision making and so forth. And finally then, the last topic that we'll get to is cognitive development. And there, the topic is, is basically illustrated by the following kind of a thing. If I hold up an object like this, and they'll come back to me here in a second, I keep bouncing them back and forth. If you hand an object like this, it's a pen, um, to a one-year-old, what will they probably do? It's actually kind of dangerous to hand this to a one-year-old. What's the first thing they'll tend to do with it? Yeah, they'll... St Stick it in their mouth. Yes, they process everything by way of the mouth, okay? You hand it to a teenager, he or she is likely to, uh, oh, well, a one-year-old, say, a, 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 a 21-year-old is what I'm trying to say. No, I'll go back. A one-month-old will stick it in their mouth if they can grab it. Uh, a one-year-old is more likely to play with it. They, you know, they learn fairly quickly. It doesn't necessarily taste good, even though it looks interesting. So a one-year-old may play with it. A 21-year-old is likely to write with it. So that will, uh, that will basically illustrate the fundamental principles we will we'll be looking at in, in uh, cognitive development. And then in the last part here, what I'd like to do is kind of whiz through uh, a little bit of a history of how we got to where we now are. So we're gonna look at essentially, the, we'll start with a more fundamental issue and that is the birth of modern science. And I would su suggest that it seems to me that Darwin's theory of evolution proposed in 1859 really represents the starting point of science as, as we practice it now. Uh, it had been, I mean, the original effort goes all the way back as far as Aristotle, whom you may remember proposed three laws of learning association that are still current even today. Um, so it started a long time ago in terms of the cognitive psych we're gonna build toward here. But that's probably, I would argue, the starting point. And psychology with Charles Darwin reached a rather interesting point because as, as of about 1879, uh, there were several problems that nobody was looking at. They were interesting, they were on people's minds and being talked about, but nobody was studying them. Things like the mind-body problem. Is there an entity separate from the physical entity that is you and me? Was one of the questions that people were looking at. A second one had to do with issues of perception. We're gonna start with those, but nobody, there was no discipline formally looking at those in the latter 1800s. Thirdly, the issues of reaction time, the fact that, that uh, and, the, and the strategy of reaction, well, that's, that's covered slightly differently here in a marker, I'll give you in a minute, but reaction time and the, the differences that you and I show in any given act uh, was not being looked at by anyone, although it was a, a variation that was of interest to people. And finally, individual differences. If you're in a lecture hall, and somebody fires off a gun, a little controversial, but if you clap your hands when nobody's looking, 
some people will actually, act, you know, literally come out of their, not literally, but they will significantly react when they're startled. You know, if some loud noise happens when you don't expect it. It's very startling for some people. Others are just calm as a cucumber. Don't even think about it. You know, kind of casually look up to see what's going on. And that essence of, of study of individual differences was not being looked at by anyone in the late 1800s. And basically it was pulled together by a series of what are typically, as you know, called schools of psychology. And if we review those, the first of them to show up was structuralism. And structuralism showed up using or introducing the concept of introspection. And 1879 is generally commonly viewed as the starting date for psychology because that was the point when you began to be able to come onto a campus, some campuses, and ask where the psychology department is. Okay, Wilhelm Wundt was the initial establisher and builder of such a lab at the University of Leipzig. He was really represented the formal separation of, of psychology from philosophy and physiology. Interesting, my first academic appointment after graduate school was at the University of South Carolina. And I noticed going into the building one day that they, it was a beautiful southern campus with, with uh, you know, brick columns and white brick buildings and white columns and so forth, but they had a, a semicircular uh, sign above, you know, and under the arch at the front porch of each building. And if you looked at that sign just right, what you could see was that right at the top centered was Department of, and down below the word psychology was off to the right side. It was way off center. And I finally realized why. And that was that that was called the Department of Philosophy and Psychology at some prior time. And what they had done was simply fancy paint black over the philosophy and representing a division of the two departments. But in fact, that separation from philosophy and um, certainly philosophy is more recent in some schools than it has been in others. But it, it was really Wundt that precipitated that. And he introduced the idea of introspection. It didn't work, but it was the idea of looking inward and reporting outward. It simply was a research technique not destined to become part of our bailiwick. <coughs> Excuse me. But he did introduce the scientific method, a deliberate technique of studying human behavior. Secondly then, and this may surprise you a little bit, I would drop in the discussion, the, the study of meaning and memory. And in essence, the name that is most frequently associated with that is Hermann Ebbinghaus. His work actually started a little bit after Wundt's, but was current by the mid-1880s. He was already actively publishing. And he introduced, among other things, he developed the concept of a learning curve, that is improvement, stages of improvement as a function of, of how many times you've repeated material. He also studied memory, had the first curves of, of loss of information over time. Once mastered, how, rap how long could you maintain it? That was Ebbinghaus in, in the mid-1880s. That was occurring. The third one, third school that we're gonna be interested in is functionalism. That, of course, was the first purely American school as it was proposed, uh, and it dealt with output. James, the person who did that, was more interested in, in the, the function, that is, why was the organism behaving as it was? And so it was its purpose that became the target there. Should I use introspection? Eh, he didn't mind, but he was more interested in ultimately looking at the goal uh, and the strategies used for getting there than anything else. So he really uh, sharpened up the, the study, broadened the, the subject matter that was looked at. And he also began to put a much broader, greater emphasis specifically on behavior itself. He was the first scientist, psychologist, to have any con major concern with practical applications. What are we gonna do with this knowledge? Fourthly then, we have behaviorism. And in behaviorism, you run into a, just a marvelously interesting character. You could do a whole seminar on John B. Watson. Watson started out at um, Furman University. He was an undergraduate, then a master's student, and then was hired for the faculty there. He was that bright when he was hired. And in fact, as young professors sometimes tend to do, he didn't fully understand the division that exists ethically between professors and students. And he uh, bedded at least one of the undergraduates at Furman. And the result of that was in a traditional Southern school, there was a lot of fuss and bother at the time, and he ultimately was asked to leave. So he went to the University of Chicago, 
which was at that point a strong point of, of functionalism, and studied there and eventually graduated with his PhD. Very bright, highly capable. He ended up gaining a position at Johns Hopkins, Baltimore. And he ultimately rose at that, in that position to become editor of the journal, uh, sorry, of Psychological Review. Um, and it was in that journal as editor that he ultimately published Psychology as a Behaviorist Views It. And that was the first formal presentation of behaviorism. Not content with that, he ended up going to bed with another student. And the result was he ended up being thrown out of Johns Hopkins in addition. And the net result was that um, he couldn't, as bright as he was, he couldn't find another job in psychology. So he ended up going into advertising. You may have heard of the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency. He rose to be vice president and was a millionaire when he ultimately retired. The interesting thing is that at his death in 19, I believe it's 1958, he had actually been welcomed back to the American Psychological Association and given a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. So we did welcome him back. We'll pick up our story next lecture.